Up next, a look at Codenames Duet, a team-based based version of the now classic party game, Codenames. This game was re received as a review copy and no other compensation was provided. All right, Codenames Duet was designed by Vlada Shavadal and Scott Eaton. It features some great diverse artwork from Thomas Krichovsky. Here in North America, it's published by CGE or Czech Games Edition. Uh, Codenames Duets takes two or more players split over two teams. A uh, single game takes uh, 15 minutes to half an hour. For a look at what you get in the box, be sure to check out our Codenames Duet unboxing video from YouTube. Uh, the components here are pretty much what you'd expect, right? A uh, ton of word cards, a bunch of clue key cards, agent and assassin tokens, and some clue counters. Uh, there's also a rather interesting pad of maps, which is for the mission mode that I'll be talking about later. Now, what I did find really interesting is that the uh, word cards here are 100% compatible with the cards from the original code names and vice versa. So if nothing else, this set does give you 400 new word cards for your copy of Codenames. Now, if I recall the unboxing, the dots that let you separate them back out again, if you want to, were really hard to find on the cards. They're like really tiny. Yeah, they are. But I got to say, why would you? Like once you put them together, I would just have my pack of Codename words somewhere. I don't know where I'd put it. Possibly, maybe I'll combine both boxes into one at some point. I personally haven't meshed my two. But once I did, it'd just be like, no, here's my Codename word set. And I would keep them together. I don't. I don't see any reason why you'd split them up once meshing them together. So, how do you play Codenames Duet? All right. Well, a game of Codenames Duet starts by laying out a five by five grid of random word cards. Players form teams and sit on opposite sides of that grid. A random key card is drawn and placed between both teams, so each team can only see their side. Now, the goal of this cooperative game is for teams to contact. 15 agents while avoiding a band of enemy assassins. Each team knows which agents the other team can contact safely and where three of the assassins are located. Now, this is indicated on that cute clue card. So, in other words, get people to pick good cards, avoid bad cards based on a crib sheet in front of you. Yep, pretty much it. Now, each round, one of the two teams gives a clue. Uh, the basic rules are you go back and forth, but there's a variant rules where same team can keep giving clues. Now, clues for people who don't know code names are given in the form of one word and one word only and a number. And the number represents the number of words on the table that match that clue. The other team then uses these clues to select one or more of the word cards, trying to find the ones associated with their agents while avoiding the assassins. Straightforward. So I could say uh, three red, trying to get you to pick rose, lips, and tomato. Right, but hope, you know, fire trucks, not also there. Although fire trucks are now yellow here in Canada, but I still think of them as red from when we grew up. Uh, now, when a correct clue is guessed, a green agent card is placed over the word, and a time token is taken. The team can then go on selecting another word if they wish. If an incorrect clue is guessed, though, the turn ends. If the incorrect clue is not an assassin, what you're going to do instead of taking a time token is you're going to put a bystander token on the card. And that's just the other side of the time token, the two-sided. And you're going to point at the team that missed the guess. Now, if an assassin is ever selected, the game ends, and it's a loss for all players. If all 15 agents are found before you run out of time tokens, then everyone wins. So not unlike games we talked about previously in this episode, Pocket science. No. <laughs> What's important to note here, though, is just because a card is showing us something for your team doesn't mean that it's the same thing for the other team. For example, there will be agents that work for both teams. So there's ones that are green on both sides of the cue card. And there's at least one assassin that's actually an agent for the other team. And there's going to be multiple agents that are bystanders for the other team. So just because you don't want your partner to pick a specific card doesn't mean they don't want you to pick that same card. Correct. Now, in addition to the basic rules, there is also a mission-based campaign thing that can be played. Uh, after successfully completing a basic game of nine time tokens worth nine difficulty, players take a map sheet from the pad, check off Prague, 
and then choose a new destination from Prague to head to based on travel lines on the map. Now, this new destination will add additional constraints to the game, either limiting the number of time tokens you get or making it so you can only hit a limited number of bystanders before losing the game. Now, this is represented by a two-digit code on the map. So, for example, uh, sorry, two-number code. Berlin is an 11-2. So what that means is you get 11 guesses total, but only two of them can be bystanders. If you find a third bystander during a game in Berlin, you would lose the game. So as we've discussed, this isn't, by your definition, a campaign. True. It's just a series of challenges. Yep. So now that we know how to play, what are your experiences with this version of Codenames? Well, first of all, I want to start out just by saying the Codename series of games are have an interesting history with us. Uh, this is due to the fact that I did not get the appeal of this series of games at first at all. When the original Codenames came out, it exploded. It, it was the hotness everywhere, including here in Windsor. It became extremely popular at local gaming events. And a weekend in Windsor didn't go by without a large table of multiple people playing Codenames. Now, most of the time I let them have their fun and I was busy teaching other games. because That's what I tend to do at local events is teach games. But one night I happened to have nothing to teach. So I joined into a game of code names and I admit I had a lousy time. Like I played two rounds, once as a clue giver and once as a guesser. I played guesser first. And during those games, I think the largest clue given all night was a three. Now, I don't remember exactly any of the words, but almost every clue switching team to team was something one. Firehouse one, uh, whatever, red one, uh, dolphin two, were like the boast, right? And the teams just easily guessed the answers. They were just blatantly obvious. Every game was on almost high until both teams were down to like one agent left. And then someone would try like a one or two word clue hoping to catch up or the player team that went first won. Like that was it. And I got to say, playing the game like that, I didn't get it. It was not fun at all. Well, understandable. It seems like this was more of a way for people to get together and play with friends than what some might call gaming. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with social experiences, but if you're looking for a game and, and get you know something with some meat on it, you're going to be disappointed. See, I, I pretty much avoided code names till that point now eventually i gave it another try and i gotta say a shout out and i'm terrible for not remembering who it was but one of our viewers of, of the podcast someone on twitter actually sent us a copy of code names because they were like you're playing wrong you didn't play it right you don't get it and i broke it out 2018 our gaming in the new year party one sean was there for that finally the game clicked in the exact moment when i gave out the clue spider-man 2 trying to get my team of spies to guess change and webs while totally missing that octopus was out there and octopus was an assassin. And sure enough, uh, web and octopus are a little closer tied to Spider-Man than change. And we lost that game. But at that moment, I realized the key to code names. And then it's all about not only connecting the largest number of words you can, and using the biggest clue you can, but also making sure those words aren't also connected to the assassin. And it was that realization that made me finally fall in love with code names and realize the two that I was playing with the first time just didn't get it. And if they had, maybe I would have discovered code names long before this. Now, this was the first time I'd ever had a chance to play code names. So I got lucky in that having a good experience with gamers. So even though it was a party and it was a social experience, it was a party game at a party uh, with gamers, right? It was right. people who weren't into that more relaxed mm -hmm. experience or who knew how to get their game on, you know, dig into the meat yeah. while still having a relaxed experience. But that's the original Codenames. What about yeah. this version, Codenames Duet? All right. So when I first got Codenames Duet, the first thing, and this is everyone, I, I bet, feels the same way. And this is something I'm trying to stress in this review so people realize that is this is not a two player only game. Like I didn't even notice that the side of the box said two or more players. I had no clue that this version of Codenames was a co op team game meant to handle two or more players. And I got to say, that was a pleasant surprise. Well, <clears throat> the term duet is loaded. Uh, so I would bet most people don't even look at the box once they hear the name because it sounds like 
It's a two-player game. It definitely does. Now, an even more pleasant surprise was just how well it works as a cooperative game and how much fun my wife and I had playing it with only two players. Now, this is my wife, Deanna, who's in the chat, and she games, who up until very recently would have sworn she hates all cooperative games. It does seem like lately we've disproved that a few times, with a Fox in the Forest duet being another example, and who, unlike me, never actually fell in love with the original code names. Like, I can get her to play it, but she's only actually doing it to be social and play with the rest of the group. Now, the more my wife and I played Codenames Duet, the more we found we were getting in sync with each other. And the more enjoyable the game got, the more we could pull out those big clues. And being in sync with the other players is actually a huge part of the Codenames experience. And another thing that made that game at New Year's better than the game with strangers downtown And that's the fact that the enjoyment of the game can be player dependent. Playing with someone you've known time is going to open up more clue options because you have more shared experiences and inside jokes and things in common. And this does seem to be a bit of a theme lately with a lot of the games you're seeing with the mind medium. Uh, We're looking at a, a shift in some portions of the industry into a more personal, almost intimate game. Uh, between two people or two groups of people bonding. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Now, one thing I do have to note, though, is the randomness of the cards can quite a bit affect how much fun an individual play of Codenames Duet can be. Like Sometimes it just feels like you're looking at 25 cards that have nothing in common, and all the ones you need your opponent to guess are completely unrelated, and that can actually be frustrating. And that's just not nearly as fun as a game where you piece together that five or six word clue. Yeah. So what, uh, what's going to be interesting though, is that every group will likely have entirely different words that do or don't work this way. And that's where that 400 word deck size yeah. is really great to see. So having enjoyed a number of two player games and code names, uh, we did try out the team rules. Uh, with our extended family, and those went over excellent. Like, the game night we broke this out of, that was the highlight of the afternoon. It happened to be Canada Day. One of the highlights of our Canada Day was playing Codenames Duet. With three people per team, we got to take turns giving clues and help each other out, guessing, and, and that. But what I can't see, and I gotta admit, due to the pandemic, I have not been able to test this theory, is I have a feeling that with more than six players, though, you may want to break out the original code names with the team based game with the two teams guessing at once. It's just going to be too many, uh, to me, too many cooks in the pot trying to figure out your clues for this cooperative version. Yeah. Co-op games of large group sizes do seem problematic, though it might be interesting to try once and see what say a 10 or 12 player game of duet was like. Uh, in the future when we can get bigger groups together we will sure give it a try and to be honest i'll edit the review i'll go in and we'll let you know on the podcast what we thought now in a sense of completeness i I try out the mission system Uh, i got another deanna and i expected it to have much of an impact on the game we're like eh, we're gonna check off a map and play code names we're already playing code names why do we need a map but it did make a difference actually because when you have a lot of clues the game's just looser. It's 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 less stressful. You have you can take your time. You can do one and two word clues and still manage to win. But when you're limited to less than the usual number of clues, less than nine in particular, you have no choice but to shoot for the moon with a big four or five or six word clue in order to win. Like you physically cannot possibly win with only two word clues. These limitations actually force you to change your play style. And I found they added a, a nice level of tension to the game. And both my wife and I enjoyed that. Oh, like the, the, it added a level of stress in an enjoyable way. Right. It was a way to make you really narrow your focus, even though otherwise you'd be able to be a bit lazy and still get the job done. Uh, sort of the training system to actually get you better at the game. Yes. I suspect that people who play a lot of Codename Duet uh, are going to be better at being able to find those those big words for uh yeah for other games and i gotta say after trying that i think our regular play you know a couple weeks later we broke it out and we just played with the normal nine clues 
we were doing a lot better because actually the game comes with 11 clues and they're in a different color. And it's like, if you need, if you beat it at nine, you succeeded. If you beat it at 11, you did pretty good, but try again. And we never needed those blue clues. And in, in our last probably three plays, we haven't even touched them because we have gotten better at the game. Now, part of that again is the connection, right? We're getting better at playing the game with each other as well as getting better with the game, which is a big part of this game. Now I do have one, a complaint and to me it's a big complaint like this one bugs me and that is the fact the word cards are easier to read from one side why this makes no sense to me when you know the the rules of the game are put them between one team and the other half the people playing are going to be looking at the side that's harder to read now i get they're probably trying to make match the look at code names where when you're playing code names yes all the guessers are facing the same side, but even in code names, like the, the people given the clues are looking at the other side of the cards. Like, I don't get it. Like, why, why, why are you making hard to read the same complaint I had with medium? Why is one side of the card? Why not make the words as big as possible? Yeah. This is one of those instances where a decision was made early in the code names product life or development life cycle that they are stuck with for compatibility. Yeah. Uh, they have so many word sets that changing them would just stick out like a sore thumb. I, I personally wouldn't care. Although I'd worry someone will give a clue based on the clarity of the words, but I'm like, I wouldn't mind if my codenames duet cards didn't match my codename cards and I mashed them up. I did. I wouldn't care. But you know what? Some people would. People like the aesthetic. And I like. I get it. They look like a name badge and there's a spot to put the code. No, just make the words as big as possible. Anyone designing a word game where I have to look down at a table and read the words, just make them as clear and readable as possible, please from all the directions you need them to be readable in. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now, in the end, um, I would go so far as to say that I enjoy Codenames Duet more than Codenames. Duet feels more focused. Uh, it's definitely more intense than the original, and I find a greater sense of satisfaction when winning a game of Duet over being the winning team in Codenames. I think it's pretty obvious. I recommend this one. I recommend Codenames Duet. Uh, if you're a fan of the original, just buy it. Like, seriously, if you have Codenames and have fun playing it, buy Duet. If nothing else, you're getting 400 more words and a great new way to play. Now, if you haven't played Codenames, I think this is a better entry point to the series. For one, it only needs two players, so it should be able to hit the table more often. Plus, if you do have big groups, you can play with teams. This is not a two-player game. Uh as always, if you don't enjoy word games, party games, you may want to give this a try, but I would suggest try before you buy. Whereas if you dig word games, I, you're probably not going to be disappointed with this one. Well, for a more in-depth look at Codenames Duet, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.